Then coming to the clinical causes of vomiting, we can divide them in several systems. It goes like this. Vomiting can occur because of disorders in the GIT, disorders of the CVS, disorders of the CNS, disorders of the genitourinary system or vomitings can also occur because of metabolic disorders, because of endocrine disorders or they could be drug induced or they could be psychogenic. So under these headings we will learn somewhat more detail about the causes of vomiting. So first thing first, the gastrointestinal system which also includes the hepatobiliary system. So any disorder of the GIT, acute gastritis, acute hepatitis, acute cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, acute appendicitis, all of these are capable of producing vomiting. All these gut disorders can be discussed in greater details somewhat later. Then coming to the CVS causes, acute myocardial infarction, very important because the patient can come with chest pain. We have already learned about causes of chest pain and how to diagnose. But the patient of MI can also present only with vomitings with very minimal chest pain or the patient may even think that the chest pain is secondary to the vomiting and because the acidic gastric contents have regurgitated to the food pipe that is the reason of the pain and sometimes the doctor can be misled because if you don't consider acute MI under the causes of vomiting you may probably not subject the patient to an electrocardiograph and then the diagnosis can be totally missed. In CVS there are several other causes too. A congested liver of congestive cardiac failure CCF can lead to vomiting. A similar way several other disorders of the CVS like pulmonary embolization, pericarditis they also can lead to vomiting in certain cases. Now coming to the CNS causes. Migraine is the most common cause which occurs in the CNS and it is characterized by a periodic hemicranial headache and which is throbbing in nature and it is associated with vomiting sensation and several times vomiting as well. So headache and vomiting are a crucial combination which occurs periodically and the patient knows about it that it comes and it goes, it subsides on its own in a couple of days or maybe in a single day. So migraine is very important, meningitis is another cause whereby you can get a neck stiffness and fever as well. We have learned about meningitis when we learned the causes of fever. Malaria also causes vomiting because of its CNS involvement and cerebral malaria is a very dangerous condition this way. Then coming to the genitourinary causes, normal pregnancy. When the pregnancy starts, in about a fortnight, the woman starts getting vomiting and they may continue for about one to two months. Tubal pregnancy is also very important. Tubal abortion is very important because at times the history can be misleading. They say the period was stopped for few days, only about 20-25 days, but now the secretion, the menstruation has occurred. So there is no worry, but we are worried because this history is very much pointing towards an abortion and uh, if it is tubal abortion that it can be a dangerous phenomenon for the lady. So in addition to pregnancy and tubal pregnancy, torsion of the ovarian cyst, torsion of the fallopian tube, all these, all these entities they can lead to vomiting. Then coming to metabolic causes, metabolic causes like diabetic ketoacidosis very important, like uh, uremia which is very important and these two causes if one cannot remember then the diagnosis can be totally missed. Endocrine causes adrenocortical insufficiency and some patients of thyrotoxicosis they come with vomiting. Then drug induced there are several drugs that when are given orally or even injectably they can cause vomiting. Metronidazole is very notorious, nitrofurantoin, digoxin, several antibiotics, some of the NSAIDs, 
all these are capable of causing vomiting when ingested orally sometimes injectable drugs can also give rise to vomiting particularly those of the opioid analgesic group even tramadol and intravenous metronidazole when they are administered they cause vomiting then the next category is of psychogenic and it is very important because the emetic center receives connection from the higher centers a patient of depression will always feel like vomiting sensation and if there is increased stress the stress is perceived by the cerebral cortex and impulses from there are related to the emetic center and the persistent vomiting sensation may occur sometimes it can lead to vomiting as well so considering all these systemic causes how should we proceed to make a diagnosis in a case of vomiting number 1 history taking for how long the vomitings have been there if the duration is long one should ask about the periodicity because in migraine patients the duration is usually long they come to you after having had several episodes of migraine and then you can ask what are the accompaniments of the vomiting i mean the vomiting occurs with a headache or does it occur with pain in abdomen is, is there giddiness is there any other symptom like fever like palpitation or whatever symptom if the patient has because one has to now uh, zero in to the origin of the vomiting and therefore all the associated symptoms must be asked about what is the status of bowel motion does the patient pass motion every day or is there constipation or loose motions associated with vomiting because then it may indicate towards the diagnosis of gastroenteritis is the menstruation normal was there a delayed period was there an absence of period for a month was there pregnancy whether the pregnancy was confirmed with a car test all these questions are very important in making the diagnosis the presence of fever and headache point towards the possible diagnosis of meningitis it can also be present there in viral bacterial or tubercular meningitis and sometimes in cases of cerebral malaria then the other questions which need to be asked about is the color of urine because in jaundice patients in acute hepatitis when the vomiting occur the color of urine usually becomes deep yellow the color of eyes also becomes deep yellow and at times the patient might have noted himself or herself that the eyes are looking yellow and at other times some other people may have pointed him out and therefore in the history taking also one can ask do your eyes look yellow does your urine have a deep yellow color what is the color of the stool these are important questions then there is history of drug ingestion what drugs you are on anti tubercular drugs in particular in the beginning they may not cause vomiting but when the pyrazinamide is added to the regime definitely vomiting do occur rifampicin and pyrazinamide are two anti tubercular drugs which are notorious in causing vomiting and they can also lead to drug induced hepatitis a history of alcohol intake is very important because alcohol can lead to acute hepatitis acute pancreatitis and even it can have injurious effect on the myocardium whatever agents they induce hyperacidity and suppress the mucus secretion of the stomach are also responsible for vomiting nsaids come in this group once the patient has taken nsaids for 2 to 3 days the mucus secretion in the stomach is badly impaired and then the acid present there can erode the gastric mucosa an acute erosive gastritis follows and the patient is not in a position to tolerate food or even water under such circumstances at times we have to give them treatment with prostaglandin analog that is misoprostol and one has to exert very high precaution in giving this because misoprostol is safe in males it is safe in menopausal women but it must not be given without consideration of the pregnancy status of the patient in child bearing age in menstruating women giving misoprostol may bring about the menstrual period prematurely and it may cause unnecessarily worry towards the patient and therefore misoprostol 
for acute erosive gastritis is best used and reserved for men and for menopausal women. If a menstruating woman comes during her menstrual period, then also mesoprostol is safe to be given, not otherwise, and not before taking menstrual history and what was the last menstrual period. So, coming to diagnosis of vomiting, then examination of the patient. Whenever a patient with vomiting comes, weight of the patient is important because we will have to administer drugs according to the body weight. Earlier, we used to see so many cases where a child of say about 13 or 14 years was given a short injection of metoclopramide and there used to be several adverse effects in the form of orofacial dyskinesia and the child will just look up like this and the whole village is worried what has happened to the child uh, he has turned his eyes upwards but if you ask the child, how are you? He is fully conscious. He says, I am okay. Bring the eyes down. He can bring the eyes down. But then involuntarily the eyes again move up. Sometimes the tongue comes out. Sometimes the tongue presses the cheeks like this. And these orofacial movements are very alarming. And they are an adverse effect of the anti-dopaminergic drugs like metoclopramide and the reason was because they did not weigh the patient. If the weight of the patient is only half of an adult, say if the child weighs only 30 kg, then half dose of the injection uh, metoclopramide should have been given. A full dose is too much for that child and therefore whenever you start a physical examination, please take body weight. Then next thing is measure the temperature because fever associated is vomiting is characteristic of malaria, sometimes in dengue fever, but many a times in meningitis as well. So fever indicates towards a different pathology in cases of vomiting. It may also indicate acute cholecystitis, acute hepatitis, acute pancreatitis, acute appendicitis, and certain urinary tract abnormalities like renal stone presenting with UTI. So temperature must be measured. Then count the pulse rate. The pulse rate is expected to be fast because if the patient has had vomiting 2-3 times, the exertion of the vomiting will raise the pulse rate. The dehydration caused by the vomiting and reduced intake of water will also raise the pulse rate. But at times the pulse rate is very high because the patient is in congestive cardiac failure and it may be irregular if the patient has had acute atrial fibrillation, acute onset of atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, these things can be diagnosed by examining the pulse cautiously. The pulse rate can be slow in cases of jaundice because of acetylcholine-like action of the bile salts which are sodium glycocholate and sodium tonocholate and they have some acetylcholine-like action and therefore the pulse rate in jaundice patient is slow. It is also slow in meningitis where there is increase in the cerebrospinal fluid pressure and that increase in the CSF pressure leads to bradycardia. Pulse rate is also slow when the patient also suffers from hypothyroidism or is there any heart block like a Wenke Bax block or a 2 is to 1 or a complete heart block because a patient with a heart block will also be in congestive cardiac failure and that is the cause of vomiting. So just Measuring the pulse rate gives you several clues. At the same time, put a pulse oximeter on the finger of the patient and check the oxygen level. Hypoxia is also a cause for vomiting in certain individuals. Next, you have to examine the blood pressure. In patients who have vomiting because of gastrointestinal and other causes, the blood pressure is expected to be low because of the reduced fluid intake because of the dehydration caused by the vomiting and the blood pressure becomes low. If the blood pressure is high, it may point towards the diagnosis of either an acute or chronic renal failure because in kidney diseases as well as in UTI, renal stones, the blood pressure is high. So measurement of the blood pressure also gives a clue towards the diagnosis of the cause of vomiting. Next, examine the conjunctiva, there could be pelor. Pelor is also contributing factor to the diagnosis of chronic renal failure. 
in the sclera you can see icterus that is jaundice and if jaundice is detected it can point to the diagnosis of either a hepatitis or it could be a severe malaria leading to hemolysis rarely hemolytic anemia hemolytic jaundice they can coexist and cause vomiting sometimes jaundice can be present if there is a biliary obstruction i mean if there is a stone obstructing the common bile duct and there is jaundice and there is vomiting because of the distension of the common bile duct then next is pancreas there are specifically no clinical signs which indicate towards the diagnosis of pancreatitis and it has always to be kept in mind however proceeding with the uh, physical examination look at the neck veins they are enlarged they are engorged in the cases of congestive cardiac failure then put a hand on the abdomen of the patient when he is lying the liver is found to be enlarged in the congestive cardiac failure it is also enlarged to some extent in hepatitis and it is found to be very hard in cases of cirrhosis of the liver there is there could be presence of ascites which can be detected by palpating the abdomen and looking at the uh, feet one can detect presence of edema which indicates towards some renal or cardiac pathology because ccf patients will have edema the edema can also be found in the patients of urinary tract infection renal stone and acute or chronic renal failure so this way concluding about the general examination then proceed towards the systemic examination of the patient having got some clue about which system is involved you can have a look at the abdomen by inspection by palpation by percussion and by auscultation and there are several causes that can be detected on the examination of the abdomen they include acute gastritis gallbladder diseases there can be presence of ascites or there can be presence of tender masses in the lower abdomen suggestive of uterus or fallopian tube pathology so concluding the physical examination of the abdomen then put a stethoscope on the precordial area you can detect murmurs which can give you the clue regarding the valvular pathology which can lead to congestive cardiac failure and of course if there is a pericarditis it may indicate toward uremia and putting the stethoscope on the basis of the lungs you can diagnose patients having ccf or left ventricular failure with pulmonary edema the cns examination particularly to look for neck rigidity kernick sign and brudzinski sign as described earlier in chapter of fever you can detect the presence of meningitis in a patient in this way the general examination and systemic examination contributes greatly towards the diagnosis of the case of vomiting in the next lecture we will learn about laboratory investigations radiological investigations in a case of vomiting and we will also learn about some anti emetic drugs thank you for having patient listening all of you who have not subscribed to my channel yet please do so and also press the bell icon so that whenever i upload a new video you will get the notification thank you again and namaste